First, I'd just like to welcome you to our first one of these for the Games Animation and VFX qualifications for new to year one. So the idea is we're going to help you guys get your head around the qualification quickly and set up. There is an awful lot to go through in this hour, so we are going to go quite quickly, but you can jot back at any point and just ask questions or again, we can come back to it again in a couple of weeks once you've had a chance to digest it. So there's quite a lot on the agenda there, um, but the basic premise of the session is to look at how to set up your program and your delivery so that you can to make sure you get the right evidence in the right place. Um, so on the call today, you've got myself and Nicola, I'm the EV manager. Um, you've got Catherine, you might wave at some point, who is a centre. Hi. Um, and you've got Mandy, who's a specialist games EV as well. Um, you've also got a couple of other AIM staff in here in the call as well, who'll be able to jump in at any point. Um, standard etiquette for our sessions, if possible, please, which is just to keep the microphone muted and use the chat for questions and then there's opportunity at the end for any further questions. However, with there only being a smaller number of us on here, feel free to just jump in at any point and ask questions and unmute yourself, don't worry, it's less of an issue. Yeah, that's fine, Sonia. Um, I've literally just rolled in the door from my childcare scenario, so <laughs> we're fine. <laughs> so, the first bit, we're looking at the um, qualification structure. Um, I'm I recognise all of you from centres who are active with us at the moment, so I'm hoping at this stage you have access to the qualification guide or the qualification specification. Um, this is the one where it's going to tell you these are all the different components and this is what you need to cover in there. So you have got a direct link here if you do need to. Um, but there's no, I'm not going to open it at this stage, but you have got a direct link onto here. The key thing to remember within this qualification is that you have your components that tell you what you need to deliver, but the actual assessment cover is holistic across a couple of different components. Um, and those assessments are set by us. And it's about really making sure you know what you need to deliver in class, but then also what you need to and what you need to cover, but then how you're actually going to assess it is quite different. And that's very different to a lot of the other qualifications on the market where you get given a, a unit and you go and teach it and you assess that one unit. Um, it took me a, quite a while to get my head around it. So I can imagine how you guys are feeling as well, trying to get your own heads around this at the same time. Again, just making sure we, you understand what the assessment briefs are and then again, the assessment tasks. Um, some of you are part of the next gen group. So obviously, please make sure you do utilise the next gen support. Um, they're able to provide you with contacts with other centres. They provide assessment tasks, um, lots of industry, experience into industry and exposure into the industry in terms of specialists and workshops and things like that. So it's always, if you are part of that, do make sure you use it and you don't just leave it running in the background. Um, because one of the requirements of this qualification is the employer engagement. So you need to keep a record of the employee, how your employees, the employer engagement is taking place over the year. And that's not just a register of, we had the following employers in, you actually need to evaluate it and say why it was useful, what the students got out of it, and even have the students themselves showing what they got out of it. You've got the exam in March for the, um, which is the core principles exam for year one. So this qualification, this session is looking primarily at year one. Um, we can touch a bit on year two, but I'm not going to go too far into it because at this point, I think you want to focus on just listening to what's going on in year one. Um, and this qualification does have UCAS points attached. So a lot, most, a lot of these students, if not most, go on to university at the end of the, the extended diploma. Um, so we are limited by um, UCAS upload dates and things like that for claims. Have we all managed to find the qualification specification and handbook at this point? I'll take I'll take a no answers as a good thing. Good, we found that one. So that is available on the website. Um, what we ask you to do is always just download it off the website because then you know you're getting the most up to date version of something. Uh, Mandy and Catherine, have I missed anything off the structure? 
No, I don't think so. No, no, not that I can um, that I can think of. Um, okay. We might come back to it in a bit. <laughs> so we've got the qualification handbook with the components in there. And then what we're going to look at today is planning your tasks. How do you plan your actual tasks that you're going to get your learners to complete? Um, so key bits in there, we've got mandatory assignment briefs. Next gen provide tasks if you're a next gen centre, but you still need to look at how you're going to do some checks on those to make sure they work for your centre. Um, how to outline the task and how it maps. Um, and we're doing quite a lot around the mapping of the tasks to your assignment briefs to make sure you've got full coverage. Um, Mandy, do you want to take on this bit because you've sort of started it and just tell me when to move slides. Right, okay. Um, um, Ian said an assignment brief, a mandatory assignment brief, um, which um, delivering the qualification this past um, seven years now, I find a very um, well-structured brief. Um, and the, the brief outlines the standards that must be assessed together to generate an assignment grade. Um, now, they, it is specified you can't deviate from these combinations of the standards. So as a centre, you create your task to cover the assignment brief. Now, what I mean by that is that when you see the you all have them as centres, you have the AIM assignment brief, and we're talking first year, we're talking ADP. Um, um, so each component that you go down through is your learning outcome in AIM's brief. As a centre, you can take that component and create a task that allows the learners to show their ability and their skills relating to that learning outcome. So as you can see here, I've said tasks are created to assess your learner. Uh, it can be done in many ways. As you know, as, as uh, lecturers, you are testing the ability of the learner. So it could be, it could be done as practical or it could be done as theory. Um, a typical task is set out in conjunction, conjunction with the learning outcome. The learning outcome is in the AIM brief and the learning outcome has been lifted from the AIM specifications. And as you know, specifications are the guidelines that specifies absolutely what has to be covered by the learner and by the centre. Um, the process allows the learner to see why they are, they are completing a piece of work. If that learning outcome is written into that task, then you're allowing your learners to take responsibility of their learning process and teaching them to understand, if I do this, then I have covered this learning outcome or AIM specifications, therefore I get a grade. So aligning your task to the learning outcomes show that you as a centre understands the structure of the qualifications and the task should be written in a way that allows all the learners of all abilities to achieve a grade. And as you know, again, the, in the way that is written, if you're writing a task, the, the actual language that is used can allow a learner with um, weaker abilities to achieve, but also gives the flexibility um, to the learners um, that are in the more um, higher skill bracket. It could be that they're uh, better at the theory than the practic practicality. So it allows all abilities. How do you feel? Yeah, I think that? remembering on this, that this qualification, in the, this qualification is based on sort of real life work practice. So a lot of other qualifications, they say, you guys go off and do VFX and do that component. You guys go off and do animation. Whereas we know that if you're working in the real world, you don't just do one task in a project, you do multiple things. And the idea of these, the holistic tasks and the assignment briefs is that it allows you to bring those together as you would in the real world, which gives better preparation for the learners going forward. So it's kind of remembering that, that it's, 
taking it away from one side but adding it in on the other. If I could maybe give an example of that, um, Nicola, that um, if a learner is creating an animation project, that animation project is um, uh, it needs the skills of learning how to create, um, how to brainstorm and how to think of a project and create the pre-production paperwork for the project. They do it in animation, but they would also do it in game design and they would also do it in VFX. Therefore, you can holistically mark across those tasks for that skill and for that learning outcome. So on, in this screen, um, this is a task created by one of the centres or by myself for my own centre for core principles of game design. So it states the component that it's covering. It states the standard, the learning outcome um, that it's going to meet, who the lecturer or the assessor is, and the title of the task. So the learner clearly can see then that it's clear instructions to them. In this task, you have been tasked with pitching a game design concept to a panel demonstrating your knowledge of core principles of game design. And it clearly bullet points what they have to discuss in the presentation. And it gives an option then of the different um, types of presentation that the learner can pick or the centre can pick. Again, that goes, uh, uh, goes with your resources. And then it clearly states the submission date um, week commencing the 21st of October. Now, if the learner completes that, then they have met the components or they have met the, um, uh, what word am I looking for, Nicola? The learning outcomes, learning outcome. <laughs> They've met the learning outcomes for core principles of game design one. So it's a very, it's a, um, this task, links very nicely then into that learning outcome and the grading then criteria can be applied to that. I think Nicola you're going to take that up later down the PowerPoint on um, the different levels of grades. Yeah. So, if I go on to that one. so we've got the mandatory assignment briefs. Um, these are found on MIA. So if you're not already on me, you do need to get your um, somebody from your centre to add you on. Um, we can have a check and have a look, see who's on there for your centre if need be. Um, and I'm going to briefly show you how to find it. She says, waiting for the screen to update. So when um, you log into Mia, it looks like it's changed on there. Um, and across the top, you go to your product library, and then if you can put in to find the qualification you're looking for. So if we're looking at the level three, and then you can go to documents across the top, you can see I've just put the slides from today. Now, these, this is our test site, so you won't quite see the same thing, but in here you'll find the assignment briefs for written art theory and asset development portfolio. And you'll also find the slides from today's session. Um, and this is also where we'll upload the videos for it. But this is really important for you to be able to access the most up-to-date assignment briefs. So if you haven't already got those, I would suggest you get log yourself into Mia to find those on there. Um, Nicola, uh, Sanya has asked a quick question about a minimum number of tasks. Um, so for one individual learning outcome, you could you could have one task. You may find you want you can put four or five learning outcomes in the one task. Um, you need to watch out for plurals on the assignment briefs and on the um, component on the yeah. um, qualification spec. So if it asks yeah. you to look at theories, you can't just look at one. But outside of that, there isn't that minimum date minimum number on there. Oh, yeah, thank you. Catherine's just put the training dates and the information around using MIA link from the website. So if you're not in MIA already, you can use that to get there. So 
So on this is the ADP assignment brief. So, so as you go through the assignment, we're going to talk about it a bit further on, but it has a set of tasks. Basically, you've got task A, task B. Now, this is a suggestion of what you could do, and then the theory is that you would then use that to be worded more effectively for the learners in your centre, because you know your learners better than we do. So you can word it better for them to understand. You can use the terminology and the software phrasing that you have access to. You do not have to use task A. If you have a different an alternative that you think would work really well to cover AF3, then you can do that. The idea is at the end, you will have covered all of these standards and you'll put all of that together into one to create a final grade for that particular assignment brief or for that assessment pack. Mandy, you'd edit them onto the end. So you've put in the links to say what the task is as an overview. And again, you've got the submission dates and that's really useful for the IQA and the EQA to be able to see the progression through the and the students themselves to be able to plan out their program. So as you can see there, there's four tasks to cover that to particular to cover the ADP. You may though, however, do think, oh well, task D is huge and the students might need, might want to do a couple of those to feel like they've got a better bank of evidence. Because technically you can get them to do as many tasks as you like. We've got some centres who do lots of really short tasks, others who do slightly bigger projects to get their teeth into. And again, that depends, I think, on the size of your cohort, the resources you've got access to, and the nature of the learners. If they're the type who are going to go home and work on this lots, they're going to, you're going to be able to approach it differently to the ones who maybe are going to need a lot of support in class. If you see, look at that, um, that D1, um, Nicola, you can see that the lecture there has put one link for all of the rest of those learning outcomes. Yeah. So, like you just said, she has created that one task, which is that um, uh, task appendice um, 3D modelling, that last one. Uh, but that task covers two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Yeah, so it's kind of, I think it's as well being thinking to build it up. So you can see this, it starts with a small one as the learners start the course and then but but then we're on to D towards the end of the programme. And you'll then start to prepare them for second year as well by giving them a bigger task. Mm. So in terms of mapping, this is my bugbear. So if we go back to that assignment brief. For you to make sure your tasks have been set so that the learners can complete, you need to make sure you've mapped them across and have something that shows you can map it across. It doesn't need to be a spreadsheet, for instance, you may just be able, you may have it on like on the previous screen where you're just showing where the tasks are. Or you may decide you want it as a spreadsheet like this that just says, OK, the introdu introduction task we're going to do in the first week, at the beginning, well, now, first few weeks of September is going to be AF3. We're also going to cover it later on again in gaming concepts because we think that the students may want to progress and have a higher grade. Using animation is going to cover the, these four. Sorry. And then we've got a task of create a waterfall later on. And you would name those tasks how it fits for your centre and what that task is asking them to do. And that, again, is depending on your own local area, your own resources. You may also think leave this in with your employer engagement. We know that some of the centres have it where they create a task and then the learners present that task to the employers. So in that situation, your task would be called something very different. And for the IQAs and the EQAs, it's just we just need to see where things are. Because it is holistic, it's very easy to just do lots of bits of evidence and chuck it in a folder. But then it comes to EQA and we're going, we can't find the match it up. And it becomes really hard to award those grades. So it's about setting it up in advance and knowing where you're covering each of those learning outcomes and those standards. So in terms of setting up your learner evidence, as I just said, make sure it's all mapped. Make sure it's clear and it's easy to locate. And please, please encourage those learners to take responsibility for the evidence in the first place. These are level three learners. OK. They are learning to be independent learners, so let's make sure they are independent learners by getting them to 
have responsibility for their learning in the first place so they know what is where i've previously taught the level three level three groups and it, you can always tell the ones who are go, when they come to you going i need help with this criteria or i need help with this versus the ones who just come in and go i don't know what to do and you can see the difference in their approach and it always works to try and get them to go down that taking ownership themselves uh, we had a couple of centers over the last year who had sort of done a lot of it for the learners and it did show at the end when they were trying to map everything it was performing a really big job whereas the individual learners would have been able to do it straight away so mandy i'm going to let you talk about blogs uh if blogs are your cho choice folks um it's advisable that you set up one blog account and add the learner accounts to it um, when I was first starting off, a really nice centre, um, uh, let me see how they had done it. And this is how they had done it. And the reason for that was that then they have control of the learners' blog pages, usernames and accounts, and it then um, avoids uh, deletion of work, etc. So you have, you have uh, total control of it. It keeps things under control and WordPress has a very good backup service. And if you contact them, then they can go back over um, into their uh, servers and bring the work, the whole the whole site in some cases, which has happened to me, the whole blog page belonging to a learner, they can bring it back for you. So you that's it on that. <laughs> I can imagine you when you come to it and you go, it's gone. So. Yeah. The first time, the first time a learner contacted me and said, my whole site's gone. You kind of just, your breath catches in your throat. But, but we got it back. It was very good. Uh, uh, WordPress was good. Yeah. Okay, um, do you want... All centres are using these blogs. They get the learners to each sort of create their own blog, which generates all their evidence. And this is really good for when it comes to things like UCAS, because they can just show the evidence straight away. Um, and you can see a time stamped change in activities going on. So that's yeah, sort of yeah. why a lot of our centres do use the blogs to evidence to provide the evidence. And it makes it easier um, to because you can just literally send them the, the links. Another another good point for it as well, and, and one of the reasons why we did it was it used to be that our learners would go with um, a memory pen, you know, when they were going to interviews for university, etc., pre-COVID. Um, now they go with a, a web address, um, and it shows it visually. It's it, it's um, uh, it's more professional looking um, to present it. But again, it's not always doable. WordPress. There's also um, uh, Google have blog pages that can be set up free. There's plenty more out there. I've seen other other centres that um, use other free web page platforms as well so you've got within google classroom you've got google sites that we yes i get them my kids school have um the primary school create blogs on there within their google classrooms so you it doesn't have to be a separate entity i don't know if there's one within the microsoft package if you're a teams school but if you're a google school you have got google sites you can use and you get quite good control over those ones you have Spark in in um, Adobe, but I think you pay you pay a fee for it. Um, so this this is a typical layout of of a centre who has created um, a blog page structure. Um, the learners have created a, a blog page structure for year one. Um, the assets development portfolio tab along the top. And art and written assignment. Art and written assignment goes together, AF1, AF2, and AF3. The art being the art, um, all of the, the sketches across all of the different units throughout the year. And then the AF1 and AF2, which is the essay components. Um, and it's it's a neat structure. And the home page is what you see, and then the tab for the assets development portfolio and then it drops down. Um, 
and that's a screen print of the drop down. And each one of these would be an individual page for an individual for individual units, but not necessarily delivered that way. That's up to each centre. Um, uh, the VFX um, tasks and the work that the learner has completed for that can go in to the VFX fundamentals page, but artwork completed for the VFX task can be put into the art and written assignment page and vice versa. But the main thing for this is that it's clearly identified and signposted. Um, and that makes um, life easier and ownership for the learner and then life easier um, for us as EVs um, coming in to find the work. Uh, I feel like um, we saying this now, don't we? You must have responsibility for setting up the page. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is a typical fundamental animation page. Um, what I find was very good for for um, in the first week and two uh, first two weeks with my learners that I I discussed the unit, I discussed the different pathways, and then I asked them to tell me what is it that this learning outcome is asking you to complete. What is this unit about? Please write up a section in your blog page and tell me what you understand this unit's about, what you understand this learning outcome's about. And this is, a, a, in the learner's own words, this is a typical layout that you see on screen. Um, they are discussing the learning outcome and what the unit's asking them for, and then down into that first learning outcome, it states throughout this outcome, I will learn basic animation, knowing the history and how it's done. So it's very clear that he or she knows this is what's going to be expected of me to complete. Um, same with the 3D tools um, unit as well. Okay, and these are, this is really um, showing evidence of the entries that the learner is putting in per learning outcome. So that's the learning outcome for 3D4, um, an introduction to it, and then the learner's work is attached in either a PDF or a Word document or a link to their files for their models for that learning outcome. Um, the learner must identify clearly with signposts which learning, which learning outcome they're working to achieve. Um, and the skills are unit approached. You can add all the learning outcomes to your unit page. What I do in the beginning of the year is I take all the learning outcomes, put them onto a Word document, supply the learner with it in Teams, and then they'll put each learning outcome in down their page ready for the work that they're going to do to be added to it. Can I just uh, have a quick question, sorry? Uh, might be too, too long, to, or, or is that later, sorry? No, go for it, ask it now. <laughs> Yeah, because um, I am not asking my students to do a blog or a website at this point. We work in Google Drive and I'm asking them to create a Google Slides presentation, which I use as a digital sketchbook for each of the components. Uh, is that okay? Yeah, it's absolutely fine. Like I said, this is just one of the things and we found that some of the centres have really got on with this, if that makes sense. Okay. So yeah, you, you, yeah, I had the same concerns. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was say is however it fits for your centre. That's keeping it so long as you can map it across. That's what we find when the centres do lots of standalone activities. That the mapping becomes a bit of a nightmare. But if you get the learning Fantastic. ownership, you should be okay. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for that. Uh, because I have the same concern that they might uh, raise things or not, you know, not post the, uh, not publish the post or you know. 
uh, while in Google Drive, I can actually see in real time whether, you know, is they're doing the sentence, I can give them feedback as they go. So I don't know, I find it quicker and safer, really. Mm -hmm. All right, thank mm -hmm. you. I would put on there about consider using tagging of standards within your blog. So, you know, when you tag documents, you can give it crazy names. So then when you, if you're an assessor or IQA, you can search for that particular standard and it will then pick up all the points where it's where the learner has said it is. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And again, any one of these learning outcomes, um, this can all be done in a Word document in a folder um, saved per learning outcome or per task as well. Like Nicola says, it, it doesn't have to be a blog. It can be whatever suits your resources within your centre. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Um, so we've got a bit, this is where it comes on to me and Catherine in the next few slides, I think. We're looking at assessing your learners. So the assessment must be holistic. And so you are assessing all of the standards within that assignment brief in one go. You can obviously assess each bit as it goes over the year, uh, but you must keep it, you, the overall grade for that particular assessment would could take into account all of it. You wouldn't then say, oh, well, for animation they got pass, but for this they got merit and so on. Um, so I've just seen a question then from Dura. Um, we'll come back to that one at the end and I'll show you where you can get some, get the resources. Um, so feedback needs to show how and why the learner has achieved and why they and why they achieved that particular grade. Um, we'll talk a bit more of that on the next few slides, but please don't just say yes, merit overall. You need to actually go through and explain why that is a merit. However, do not grade polish. So don't say you can't tell them what they need to do. You can just say why this particular one has achieved that particular grade level. And just remember those resubmission rules. It's all in the handbook to explain when, how, when they can resubmit and so on. Feedback can be written or recorded. You could even co do comments on the blogs. Obviously, just consider the privacy and the situation there if, you're, if it is open uh, as a public blog. Uh, too quick. So, when you come to reference to grading, reference the grading descriptors. So in your assignment brief, there's a section that talks about grading and it bears no resemblance to the components whatsoever. Um, and this is where people get a bit worried because they go, well, hang on, we've been teaching this, but you're assessing slightly differently. But what you are doing, you're assessing those learning outcomes based on these particular grading um, descriptors. So you need to match the task and the specific content to the descriptor and identify your specific evidence to support it. Do watch for plurals. So you know when it asks for, um, in written art, it does ask for you to talk about artists, not just artists. Um, and then use, can look at using a grading matrix. So you, if you remember at the beginning, I had that spreadsheet set up with all my tasks. You can then obviously identify what they've achieved because they need to cover all of the assignment brief at that grade to be able to get the grade. And then the feedback needs to show how and why the grade is being awarded. I'm going to quickly go to a different document. So this is the ADP. Um, and you can see that there's obviously the various bits about the information. It tells you about the components, such as the art fundamentals and so on. A bit of reflection and then scroll all the way down eventually we get to the mark sheet so it says for a pass at technical skills the work presented demonstrates the use of a range of technical skills methods and procedures to create and manipulate assets at merit it's assuming pass plus demonstrates advanced skills then there's some for example and then at distinction it's going to contextualization adaptation and combination of various skills so you can see you're moving up through the grading there and it's applying that grading descriptor to the standards within your task. 
and also this bit helps in terms of it's done, it's the technical skills for games design for project management and so on um for things like the computer programming and the maths obviously you're leading more into the exam rather than the assessment tasks but there will be the odd bit where you the learners are starting to evidence it to help you work out your predicted grades and so on so i was hoping we can go to slido in a minute um what I, would, I was going to ask you to do at this point is give me an example of how you could use feedback for to identify P, so paths. So, so work presented demonstrates the use of a range of technical knowledge, skills, methods and procedures to create and manipulate assets. So if you go into slido.com and put in Y286 and then you put your comments in there, it will pop up on this screen. Um, and that's what I'm looking for you to do. See if you can put, come up with how would you give feedback. So if I go, what sort of feedback could you give to as a that you would expect to see for a pass grade? So we're looking at using the range of technical knowledge, skills, and methods and procedures. So you might be talking about um, they've shown that they're able to use vectors in their um, VFX to create something in there, or they've shown that they can do within the animation they've got the level of detail they've come up with for the animations that shows that they've been able to render it and create a smooth image so we'll be using looking we're saying that they've been able to use those skills and you'll be able to like, literally reference them in your feedback obviously once we go to advanced skills and then we're looking at contextualizing so then bring it into a real life environment rather than just being a picture an animation of a ball bouncing it becomes an animation of a ball bouncing over a net or so on so this is where you would then start to add in your feedback i'm going to go back a slide for a second just so we can see that again i'll take it none of you want to go near slido then so we're looking at those grading descriptors which i've lost on the screens there so making sure you do give that feedback that represents what's actually going on in that particular area we, i think we've probably covered mapping evidence enough times now in this session but again make sure you've got a consistent approach to identifying the activity the learner's working at um, i have some centers who do um, have a massive spreadsheet with lots of hyperlinks others there are blogs it really is what works for your centre to make it really clear. Um, I would always recommend bringing in somebody out of the team to have a look at it and say, can you find the evidence for this? If they can find the evidence, you're good. If they can't, then the chances are when you present to EQA, they're also going to struggle. Catherine, have you got enough connection to do um, IQA or do you need me to do it? Hopefully you'll be able to tell me in a moment if nobody can hear me. We can hear you at the moment. <laughs> okay, jolly good. Um, right, so uh, my role is a, a centre lead, so I, I'm overlooking the compliance with, within the centre. So I, I'm just doing this little bit about what AIM expects from the internal quality assurance in the centres. No different from any other qualifications in many ways, but tasks are internally verified prior to use. And that includes the next gen tasks that were mentioned earlier in the presentation. For those of you that are familiar with them, next gen have written some very good tasks, but you do need to make sure that they are fit for purpose in your center and with your learners. And what they generally haven't done is mapped them to the criteria as well. So you need to make sure that, that you do that and you're clear and your learners are very clear as to what they're actually evidencing and achieving by doing those tasks. Particularly for, for you, because you're new to the games, very much an interim IQA of your assessment and your assessors is really crucial, isn't it? That if it's a new course, a new qualification, that you've got that structured. Don't get, <laughs> Sorry? 
don't get to the end of the year no don't get to the end of the year and suddenly think oh i better have a look at that then no very much early as early as you possibly can i'm always i'm a great believer in doing things as early as you can and then you can weed out any problems right from the start final iqa so when you are actually ready to claim final iqa of the learner portfolio think about your sample size and risk rate that that will inform your sample size and again new qualification new tutors for some of you new awarding organization then i would expect your sample size to be quite high cover all your assignments and all your grades make sure that you are looking at everything you don't just look at a little bit of a, an assignment you need you need to be looking at the whole thing holistically again come across it in times where people don't look at the whole unit they don't iv the whole unit they just iv certain criteria you don't get a full picture that way so you do need to do that we need to see evidence of the employer engagement there are documents on the website and they will be on me shortly so you've got a template for for completing that and make sure that the employer engagement is for each learner as well so it's not just for the cohort so each learner has to demonstrate that employer engagement there's also a requirement these days for learner destination data and again that will be made very clear to you once it once you get towards the end of the qualification the end of the course so you don't need to remember all of these and make sure your evidence is backed up we talked about that before that cyber attacks and that's that's been not exactly common but there's been a few centers hasn't there this year that have had a few cyber attacks so making sure i think if you're doing those are all um i would really suggest you print some to pdf or something at uh, points of iqa just so you've got some backup to show that it was there so if you're then in a situation where you can't access it because of some cyber issues we had some centers who they literally had a center a cyber attack during EQA time, so they couldn't have didn't have any evidence to present. But because we'd be able to see it at interim, and we'd be able to see it earlier in the year, we could say, well, no, we knew it was there. It's just missing for this week. Mm. Um, so yeah, yeah, just try and back it. Think about how you're going to back it up in somehow. Totally, totally. And actually, going back to the the interim IQA and final IQA, and um, your questions about um, when to do that, Sanya. What I would also say as an extension to that is booking for an EQA as well. Don't be waiting till the end. I'm not sure whether you've already sent those out, Nick. We haven't gone out yet at all, so but, you'll be able to no. get something. I think most of the centres go through either December, January, February, and then yeah. June is the second one. Yeah. So you've got enough that you can actually make a make a, a, a judgment but it's early enough that there are any issues then they can be they can be picked up early on yeah and, and the evs are very happy to do that aren't you mandy if you're if you're allocated to that center but the evs are very much look at it early spot the problems especially if you're not used to doing this kind of qualification Pro are, sorry, as a, sorry, Catherine. So is that some sort of an uh, interim uh, external verification? Yes, or, yes. Or, yeah. It's not the final yeah. one at the end of the year. No, right? no. I, I would strongly suggest that you do an interim with whoever okay. is your allocated EV. And then yeah. another one at the end. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah. I, it's it's just, just identifying issues before they become problems, isn't it? We don't want to get to the end of the course and find that you've missed out massive big gaps or you haven't been using the assignment briefs or, or whatever there may be or the evidence is about COVID, so. um the games calls last year and the year before were in a brilliant situation when the closures hit because it, a lot of them had already, they'd already had well certainly the first year they'd already had an interim so we had quantifiable controlled evidence that we could use to provide the calculated grades with and then last year the AEVs were able to come in pretty much straight after and see where the issues were so touch wood but on the off chance there's any more closures or anything like that if you've got interim eqa it's one of the bank it's one of the of course recognized things for having good evidence in place so it keeps them happy yeah it's, 
it's been crucial really hasn't it nick over the last couple of years okay. not that there will be covid anymore it will all be it's going to be the same but... anymore we, for all the other for years we were always told to you have to make sure you had evidence in place in case you were real now we're going to be like yeah covid <laughs> yeah yeah totally totally but yeah uh, get get an early ev in sanya whoever is your allocated ev once that's been decided and all then right, that thank will, you. That, yeah cool okay yeah. next slide good old mia <laughs> so mia is our center management system i briefly showed you on our test site a few minutes ago um, this allows you to control your provision in one central place um, you can update your staff and system users you can maintain your details you can communicate with us with re referencing specific reports so you will be able to see all your EV report on there and you can actually see it being edited in time in real time as well um, you can use the product library to see the full, the full qualification portfolio and you can also see what you're approved for um, you can apply for new qualifications and you can overview your actions and risk rating and see when your next visits are due and so on. Um, the link to get there is miaportal.org.uk and you've got the link there for guidance to it and Catherine also put it in the chat earlier. Um, there is regular training sessions running on it. I would thoroughly recommend you get onto one of those sessions. It's a one hour session and it does actually explain it a lot better than we can. So I would totally recommend them. And the good news Sorry is- Sorry to jump all... in. Um... Again, sorry to jump in again, but I've just tried booking myself in and it says, because uh, it's this week, isn't it? And it says it's sold out. I have I have emailed inquiries because I, another centre earlier on today wanted to look on and I noticed that they finished this week. So I have emailed inquiries to ask them to put on, so, when they're planning on putting on some more dates actually, Sonia. So oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think they're going to be going to one a week um, and I've also asked for a video to be uploaded to the website as well from a recording of many of the training sessions that we have been doing since a few months ago now. So hopefully they'll, that will be in the pipeline very soon as well. Oh, that would be great, yeah, yeah, if possible. Um, so other things AIM needs from you. We will ask you as the year goes on for destination data. Now, if you guys just running year one, your destination data will basically be progression to year two, hopefully. Um, but obviously, once you get to the end of year two, we will ask you for sort of, we just want to know sort of which universities they're going to, are they going on to do a games qualification in the university or are they going on to do construction? Um, it's about showing that the qualification has worth. So if they're going into apprenticeships and they're getting jobs, it's showing that it's been effective, so it should be funded as, for a longer period. Your employer engagement log, this is at the end of your, it's in the, um, Qualification specification, the template you can pick up, I think. There's definitely one somewhere. Um, and again, just showing how effective your employer engagement was. Record of standardization, just particularly when you guys, if you're new to it this year, in terms of your grading and things like that, you want to make sure you've got some really consistent approaches. Um, registrations, please get yourselves registered in a timely manner. I know for most places it's the 1st of November you start getting everything registered for. If you're not registered, we can't send you information about exams. So if you don't register your learners until much later, you get charged late registration fees and you won't get that important information. This was crucial in COVID-1 when the exam was, was um, cancelled within about two weeks notice. So we needed to know who was going in. Make sure you're scheduling for the exams. All the exams information is available on the website um, and make sure you're getting the right dates in there for those. I want to say it's February for this exam, but Cathy will tell me if I've got that wrong. Um, make sure you're responding to EV requests when they drop your message and ask you to book in for certain days and make sure you've got your evidence available. And then activate MIA, get that train again, the training is available. Um, we thought it'd be useful to drop into this session about some other qualifications that you might find interest of interest. So we've got the level two um, aim box which are skills for, for the creative industries which includes games design and we do have a few centers who do that and the learners naturally do a progression on so they do a level two and then they offer it at level three with us um we've also got the level four we've not got as many centers doing that because it seems to compete more with the h and d's in the um university courses but again it is there if you're something you're looking at 
Um, and we have probably three or four of our centres offer the eSport, the award or extended award for eSports as an enrichment for the learners. Um, so you've got, again, just knowing that that's in there. So I would imagine this year you're not going to be looking at that, but going forward, if you find the learners are really getting into it, you've obviously got some extra bits there and you've already got centre approval. So you can just add those qualifications on with a fairly straightforward approval process. Useful links, we just thought we'd keep that in there for when you get to download the, hand, the um, document. And then we've got scheduled dates going forward. So we, as well as these new two games, we also offer sort of the general game sessions for, the, for, the, for all centres. And these are the dates in there at the minute. Um, and what we're really asking for uh, all of these players is what do you want from the clinics? Is there any particular topics? Um, and we've also got a link there for you to provide feedback on this particular session. Um, I will try and email it out to you guys as well in the next couple of days so you get the direct link. Um, I'm going to come back to the very beginning when I said about um, postponing Thursday's session and turning it into sort of a follow up in a few weeks time. Is that um, anything people would be interested? Would you like a follow up from this session in a few weeks when you've had a chance to digest this and you've maybe come up with some questions or you start to to create your tasks and things and you're starting to wonder about it. Would it be a good idea, Nick, to maybe put something in for two weeks today as, as a sort of drop in really that people could come to or? Yeah, would you rather? Yeah, would, I think that might work. Would that be useful? Yeah, um, or, I'm just looking at my calendar myself. So we're talking. Yeah, there's, there's, um, two people have just sent a message in um, uh, in chat three um, who are interested. Yeah. So, yep, right, so, right, right. <laughs> um, so if we look at, we'll, we'll put another session in for two weeks' time. So that's going to be Tuesday. The that's 12th. the 12th. That's um, the 12th. Yeah. Again, um, if we won't have it as structured as this and we'll give it a chance for you if you want to bring some tasks and have a, and ask us to look at things or again as I say Ben said can we look at how two is going to be two is going to be different because you need to look at the synoptic project which has got a different scenario around it um, and like I say a chance just to see yeah start to make it come when you come with your questions I think is going to be the really important bit there um, and we can see what we can answer and go from there Is four o'clock okay for people? I appreciate you've got childcare and things to pick up, but in general, silence means yes. Yes, <laughs> I think for the most <laughs> you know, it gets you. You're not teaching. Not as much teaching is going on at this time, is it? So you can just drop into these sessions. Um, what we'll do, I will ask them to change the bookings on the website, and we'll send you a link just to get you to book back in, so you get your links again. But I think we'll try and make that an open access one in a couple of weeks' time anybody else who also wants to attend. Okay. 